Okay, so I think we'll get, get started. Uh, this session is about the workflow initiative. We've got a URL there for, for D.O. That's where the plan is. This is going to be a, a very much a, an evolving plan. We've tried to put together uh, as much as we can sort of how we want things to work for the next two, three years. And if anyone has any suggestions, any comments, we're going to be changing that plan sort of as, w as we go through. Uh, we've already started making changes to it this week. So uh, yeah, pull that up and, and follow along. So I'm Tim Millward. Um, I've been working on this kind of stuff in Contrib for the last kind of nine, nine months to a year. Um, and, and I'll be dedicating the next kind of two years almost full time working on, on this core initiative. And then we've also got uh, Dick. Um, I'm Dixon on, on D.O. Um, I'm, I'm a long time core and contrib uh, developer. Um, I'm the author of the deploy module for Drupal 7, which is kind of related to, to the topic. So I've been working in this space for, for many, many years. Um, I'm also the uh, creator and co-maintainer together with uh, Tim and, and Andre and Tim with uh, these the same modules in, in Drupal 8. And I'm also the initiative coordinator for, for the new uh, workflow initiative that we'll be talking about here. So really excited. Good to see so many of you here. I'll also give a shout out to Andre. He sat down the front here. Uh, he's working on this core initiative uh, full time with us as well and been working on the, the contrib modules for the last two, three years. So we're going to start off talking about the contrib modules and what we've been doing there. It's all based on deploy. Uh, as Dick was saying, deploy's been going from Drupal 7 back to Drupal 6, Drupal 5. So we've been working on this stuff for, for years, for years and years, and trying to sort of perfect the workflow. And I think with, with Drupal 8, we've got a very good workflow. It's all based on CouchDB. So we're not actually using CouchDB, but we're using the same API protocol. This allows us to, to replicate content in a very robust way, a way that's been working very well with CouchDB for a number of years. So we start with multi-version. This is kind of the base module for our contrib stuff. This makes everything revisionable, so every content entity in core and contrib multi-version changes to be revisionable. It also adds a number of underlying storage changes, things like um, deleting entities. It doesn't delete them anymore. It just keeps them and archives them. We can then purge them later on. Uh, we've got a number of indexes that we store information. So this is a very sort of underlying storage stuff. We've then got the replication module. This, again, is very much sort of underlying stuff. Um, for replication, it allows us to see sort of what's changed between different workspaces. I'll come to workspaces later, but different workspaces, different sites, and we can see sort of what content changes have been made, and this allows us to, to replicate content. So in the workspace module, workspaces you can think of a bit like Git branches, but for your content. So you have a live branch with all your live content and you'd have a stage branch for all your stage content. You can create as many workspaces as you need, so when you're creating a new sort of content feature, whether this includes nodes, blocks, menu links, taxonomy terms, whatever, they all go into a workspace. And then you can deploy them to a different workspace on the same site, or a different workspace on a different site. And because we've based a lot of this on, on CouchDB, you can also replicate over to CouchDB. <coughs> you can replicate to PouchDB that runs locally. So there's a lot of sort of power from, from using these workspaces. So talking about CouchDB, Relax Web Services is the module that we've used to implement the CouchDB API. It works off the core REST API and adds the, the endpoints needed to work with CouchDB. As I said earlier, this gives us a very robust API for replicating content between sites and between CouchDB and other compatible services. But it doesn't use CouchDB. Um, it's, we've completely sort of written it. 
And, and as Tim mentioned, just want to emphasize that uh, you don't necessarily need this module if you just do staging and previewing on a single site. This, this module comes into play when you have separate sites for your stage and production or just want to replicate between different sites over HTTP. Just a note. Right. So then finally we've got deploy. Deploy is kind of the overarching thing for all of this. Um, as I said, it's a very old module, so we sort of worked up from, from the previous modules. And it gives a UI for deployment. And whether you're using relaxed module for cross-site replication or just the workspace module for single-site replication, deploy will give you a UI to, to deploy between things. And uh, after the session, if we've got time, we can go through a couple of demos just to sort of see visually how, how the UI works and how Deploy does this. And uh, uh, just one, one note. Um, as we go through this plan, issue by issue, uh, this is a core conversation. So please interrupt at any point if you have any questions. We don't necessarily need to take all the questions at the end. Uh, we want to keep the conversation going. Uh, it's going to be lots of details, issues, and, and technical details. So please, you know, step in, raise your hand, step up to the mic, and, uh, and we'll keep the conversation going. Okay, so let's uh, get on to the, the actual initiative. As I said earlier, we've got the plan um, that you can take a look at and try and follow through, and yeah, do step up if you've got any questions. Each of these slides will sort of loosely relate to a, an issue or a sort of a, a step within the plan. The first one here is enabling revisions by default. This is a, an issue that I opened last year in, in DrupalCon LA, and we're basically looking for that checkbox, create a new revision on nodes and blocks, to always be checked. And when you create a new content type, it should always be checked. So we get into this idea that revisions are always created, and sort of by default, we should have revisions. So that issue there is currently in uh, needs review status. So if anyone wants to start taking a look at the sprints tomorrow or over the weekend, um, please review that. Are you going to remove the checkbox from the UI? Maybe one day. Re repeat the question. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, so the question was, are we going to remove the, the checkbox from the UI? In this patch, it doesn't remove the checkbox. Um, but yeah, maybe one day we can. Uh, with the contrib work, so with multivision, we do enforce r uh, revisions. So we keep the checkbox, but you can't uncheck it. Um, so in contrib, if you are using multivision, everything's revisionable, and you have no choice. It's revisionable, um, because we believe that's the way it should work. Uh, but in the, in the implementation details for the rest of the initiative, we can, we can discuss that. Uh, and a little bit more reasoning behind that. So um, if you do the same thing with code, if you have a workflow, if you move around, stage your code, it's not like you can turn off revisions on Git. It needs to be there for fundamental reasons to, to be able to move things around, to be able to merge things and solve conflicts. We sort of deal exactly in the same problem space here, really, with content. Uh, moving content around, merging between stage and production, uh, and needs to solve conflict. So that's why revisions I is like this core concept that needs to be there. Um, but yeah. So the next issue is done. This was committed to core um, a couple of weeks ago. So this is um, having base field definitions that inherit from their parents. All content entities extend the content entity base class and in there, you have base field definitions for things like the ID field, the UUID, uh, the revision ID, uh, the bundle. All these kind of fields are, are in content entity base. But so many of the core entities weren't inheriting those. They were resetting those base field de definitions. So this uh, core patch that's now in, it will uh, go into 8.2, uh, we inherit. And this allows us potentially in the future to just kind of turn on revisions for any entity type and it will get that revision ID field from the parent. The next one that's also been done 
is the node interface is now implementing the revision log interface. So in 8.1, we added a revision log interface. Um, so you may know that on a node, you can add a revision log message. On block content, you can add a revision log message. And this interface uh, adds a number of methods uh, for that uh, revision log. Um, but node interface wasn't using that interface. So we've uh, updated that, deprecated a number of old methods that didn't use, uh, that weren't in the interface, and, and added the new methods that are in the interface. So the next one is for block content. We need to get that interface also working with block content. The issue is that we don't yet have a revision user and a revision created field on block content like we do on nodes. Um, so this patch that's in need to review, again, if you're doing sprints this weekend, please review. Um, it adds those two fields, the, the revision user and the revision created, and then it changes the, uh, the block content interface to implement the revision log interface, um, doing the same as nodes, just to keep them all consistent and all working the same. So once we've got all that in, we're going to want a way to migrate entities between entity type schemas. So this is a very complex uh, problem, and it's probably the most complex issue that we've got for our phase one. Phase one, we're planning to get it into 8.2, which is out in October, and we'd like to make everything revisionable. So users, menu link content, taxonomy terms, every content entity in core we want to make revisionable. But that means changing the schema. It means adding new tables. It means changing tables. So we need a way to migrate entities from the old schema, the non-revisionable schema, to the new schema. We do this already in multi-version, in Contrib. The way we do it there is with migrate module. So migrate module is in core, it's still experimental, but we use it with multi-version to basically delete all of your content, change the schema, and put all your content back again. <laughs> so that's probably not the best way of doing it. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, and the reason here uh, is that it's built into the entity API. A, a assumption saying that we can't change the schema for you if you have content already. Because that, that's the very core part of the migration problem here. This is why we sort of uh, stash away content temporarily, remove storage, create story, the new storage, and then put the content back. Uh, but as Tim said, the approach will uh, probably be different for when we get this into core. Yeah. So we're currently discussing ideas like update hooks um, that will go in and create the tables that aren't there and copy the data that needs to be copied and all these kind of things. But if anyone's got any really good ideas, then please head into the issue and, uh, and share them. Um, we'll be really interested in, in hearing them. Uh, and one final note on this one. Uh, it's it's going to be tricky depending on migrate module since it's experimental, as Tim said. Uh, uh, for, for a crucial part in core, we can't depend on an experimental module, so we probably need to find ways around that. So once we've got that worked out, we can make everything revisionable. Um, I've already started working on this patch, so you've got the issue there. Um, the patch kind of isn't really blocked by the migrate stuff, but it can't, can't get committed until that migrate stuff is done. So. Um, at the start of this week, I had about 350 failing tests. I'm now down to about 123, I think. So we're making fairly good progress on making everything revisionable. But as I said earlier, we're looking to make all core content entities revisionable, which I think is sort of a fundamental, fundamental thing. And every time I tell people that we are looking to do this, they look at me kind of puzzled of why aren't they revisionable anyway? and why are block content revisionable and nodes revisionable, everything else isn't. So we need to try and get this in. So that's the last uh, part of our phase one. And as I said, phase one, we're going to try and get into 8.2 in, in October. So going on to phase two, 
revisions don't have UUIDs. We added UUIDs for entities in uh, Drupal 8, but not for, um, not for revisions. Another thing we're looking at is revision hashes. So in, in multi-version, in contrib, we add revision hashes. And the reason we do this is because if you add some content on your stage site and you deploy it to live, and then you make changes on live and make changes on stage, if they're the same change, we want them to create the same revision hash. So if you replicate, we know that we've already got that revision. They've got the same hash. They're the same change. We don't want to introduce a conflict when the change is the same. So a UUID won't give us that, that functionality, but a hash will. So do we add a UUID or a hash or both? What's the best way of doing that? So there's an issue already open here where there is a patch that's adding a UUID, um, but maybe we need to add another issue that adds the hash or, or update that patch to also add the hash because that's going to be a very important feature when we start looking at replicating content between workspaces. Yeah, so, uh, so the question is, are we hashing the, 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 uh, the entity? And we are hashing the entity. It's not the final rendered entity. Um, and we are excluding a number of fields as well, uh, things like timestamp, because obviously if you make a change on different sites, then they're going to have a different timestamp. And what's uh, practically happening is that we're running you through the serializer. Uh, so it's serialized to a JSON string, and that's what we hash. So the next uh, issue on our phase two is parent revisions. Uh, we haven't yet got a, an issue open for this. And we want to know where a revision comes from. So we want to be able to log somewhere what a revision's parent is. And this makes it really useful for resolving conflicts. So if there is two revisions with the same parent, we know that they both came from the same place, but therefore they are conflicting, and we need to resolve those conflicts. We then resolve a conflict, and a revision has two parents. Um, uh, there are two conflicting revisions, and we merge or we resolve that conflict in some way, and it produces a, a child stemming from those two parents. Uh, very much like Git, really. Every commit has a parent, and a merge commit, i.e. the fix of the conflict, has two parents. So you know where what revisions you fixed to make one. Right. So then once we've got that in, we're going to look at a deleted flag. Again, this is something we've got in multi-version in Contrib where we flag revisions as being deleted. So when you delete any content entities, it creates a new revision, and that revision is flagged as deleted. This allows us to do so many things. We can now add a trash bin into, into core. There's already uh, the trash module that we've got that works with multi-version that does all this. So you can restore content after it's been deleted. And this also allows us to do replication of deleted content. So if you delete something on stage and you replicate up to live, then it also deletes on live. If we sort of properly deleted it, if we purged the content, then we'd replicate up to live, and live would not really have any idea sort of what the content is, um, so it wouldn't get deleted. And more importantly, if we did a pull before a push like you would in Git, it would actually pull down the the content that you deleted from live. So that content would sort of reappear. Um, so we really need to flag things as deleted. Another key aspect here is also you won't be able to solve a conflict involving a delete if there's nothing to compare with. So it's, it's fundamental that when once we delete, it actually is not removed from the database. We can present these two new changes if they are conflicting. One might have done a change, and one wants to delete content, then we can resolve that conflict. So it's a very important aspect. Yeah, so 
Now, with this deleted flag, you can't delete things because things are just flagged as deleted. They're not actually deleted. So what we need to do is purge revisions. Um, so currently with the trash module, um, you can purge things. And this just runs sort of the old um, proper sort of core delete, and it actually gets rid of and purges, uh, purges revisions. Um, as we said, there's a number of reasons why you shouldn't purge things, but if there are sort of legal reasons of getting rid of content, then we need to have a way in core to sort of actually get rid of content. And, and uh, so as you can see on the slides, this is phase three, and this is something that we're targeting or aiming to get into 8.3, yeah. Drupal 8.3, which is uh, yes, sometime next year. This time next year, yeah. So once we've got these in, we can look at adding the trash module into core. So you'll be able to, from the UI, restore and purge any uh, content. So this is something that WordPress has had for years. It's something that sort of your desktop OS has had since 1984. <laughs> so there's a number of reasons why we should get this into core, and it's well overdue. And and, and this would be the first point in the initiative where we actually add uh, some significant user interface changes as well, or additions, I should say, um, introducing this UI that Tim just talked about. Uh, it's uh, notated as phase four, and as you can see in the plan, it's still uh, targeting 8.3. Um, we split up the phases so that they don't depend on each other. Um, and and it, that's just a target, it's still up for discussion. And, and so on, and yeah. Great. So the next phase, phase five, we're gonna start looking at moderation. So though almost every site needs some kind of moderation, and we've been working a lot with the uh, Workbench moderation team. So you can kind of see this as an effort to get Workbench moderation into core, but again, this is still up for discussion, um, and the way we've been working in, in Contrib with Workbench moderation is you can moderate entities and you can moderate workspaces. So you can moderate an individual node, for example, or you can moderate a whole workspace, which is um, nodes, blocks, menu links, everything together, and deploy that as sort of published. So this phase, we're just looking at the underlying API that's gonna make all of that possible. So a lot of this, at this stage, will still live in Contrib, but we'll have this core API for, for doing moderation. Um, and this is a, a step that a lot of people seem to get uh, really excited about and really keen to, to get into core. And um, we'll talk about uh, more APIs here down the line, but I think this is gonna, for, for many people, uh, for many site owners, this itself, once we add a simple UI on top of this, is gonna cover a big, big uh, use case that many have. Simply just uh, moderating individual entities. As simple as that. You know, everyone won't need a full workspace and moderate a whole workspace, but the, but the um, uh, phases and the APIs are set up, set up in a way, as Tim said, that we can do both. Uh, so it'll be a very flexible and powerful system where we uh, can moderate both individual entities as well as whole workspaces. Great. So once we've got that in, we're gonna start looking at trying to get workspaces into core. So this is um, an initial API for, for workspaces. And I mentioned earlier we've got the workspace module. That doesn't actually add workspaces. That's added further down the line in, in multi-version. So this is kind of what we're looking at doing here. We're gonna add multi-versions workspace API into core at this phase, which adds the workspace as a content entity, and then all content belongs to a workspace. From the UI, that will be completely invisible. You will have one default sort of live workspace. All your content will belong to there. Um, and that's sort of how it will initially work. That's how it works with multi-version at the moment until you add the workspace module that gives you that UI to create and switch workspaces. So uh, the behavior of core would not change at, at this point. This is just API additions, and as Tim said, it's just one default workspace, no behavior changes. 
So we've got a number of indexes, also a multi-version module, and this allows us to do to do so much stuff. But a UUI, uh, a UUID index is probably the first place that we're going to look at for the the core work, and we've already started a, an issue on that and just started looking at how this is going to work. In multi-version, we use a key value store, and we store all UUIDs, and then against that, we store the the entity type, the entity ID, the revision ID, and sort of a load of other information about that UUID so that given a UUID, you know what it is. Because at the moment, we have unique identifiers, UUIDs for content, but given that unique identifier, you have no idea what it identifies. You don't know if it's a node or a block or a menu link you know nothing about it. So this index will give us a place to look up and find out what these things are. And this becomes important when we start to look at uh, replicating content, because we're going to have to use UUIDs for everything, because local IDs are going to be different on different workspaces, on different sites. We have to use UUIDs for everything. So once we've got a, an index for entity UUIDs, we can add an index for revision UUIDs or revision hashes or both, whatever we go down the road of, of looking at for them. And they're going to do exactly the same as the entity UUID indexes, but just for revision UUIDs. So given a revision UUID, you'll know exactly what entity type it is, what entity it is, and what uh, revision th that points to. So we've then got another index. This is a sequence index. And this is a, a real big index of everything that's going on in your site. Again, it's something we do in multi-version. And it's a key value store, which is ordered by the sequence ID. And we know everything that you do on the site. Whether you add, update, delete content, we know what entity type it is. We know what entity ID it is. We know what revision ID it is. And they're all ordered so that when we do the replication, we can play it back, just like when you do a sort of a rebase with Git, you play back every commit. You could almost compare it to um, a MySQL binary log or uh, a Git commit log, almost. A way of replaying changes. And it also allows us to uh, to compare sites, and we can look at sort of what sequence ID um, one site is compared to another site. So when we are replicating, you need to, you, you know sort of what needs to be replicated, if anything at all. So once we've got that in, we can look at replication services. We've got two services: the changes and revision diff services that are part of the replication module, and these allow us to know, first of all, with the changes uh, service, we know what has changed on the site. And this uses the sequence ID as well, so you can know what's changed since a certain sequence ID. And then we've got the revisions diff uh, service. So once you have a number of changes, you can look at those changes compared to another workspace or another site and know what revisions are different on each site. So when we come to do the replication, we only replicate the revisions that are different between the two sites. So the uh, revision diff the hash? So the question is, does the revision diff use the UUID and the hash? Yes, at the moment we use the, the hash. Um, so we have the, the entity UUID, and then under that uh, a number of uh, revision hashes that uh, so we know the entity and the revisions that relate to that entity. And a quick follow-up on the diff, just uh, like give me two or three words. Uh, diff, it's the uh, list of conflicts that um, really alleviate CMS. So the question is about uh, conflicts. Do we get a, a three-way merge for conflicts? We'll come to that in the future. Um, th later on in the plan, we do look at conflicts. Um, we are flagging conflicts. Um, as I said, with the, the parent revisions, we know that there are conflicts. Um, so we can tell if two revisions have the same parent that they are conflicting. Um, but there's currently no way to, to sort of merge or resolve those conflicts. Even in Contrib, there's no, no way to do that yet. 
Um, at the moment, we just sort of pick one of the two conflicting. We have a Google Summer of Code project. So we've got a student who's going to be working on a conflict tool for this. And hopefully, it's something that we can sort of put out to the wider PHP community. And it's not sort of Drupal specific for resolving conflicts. Uh, the APIs <coughs> are structured in a way that a uh, full three way merge is possible. Uh, so we can do very, we can implement the most complicated merge ag algorithm if we would like. Um, a three way merge is basically where you have your local change, your remote change, and then the common ancestor of the two. You have three revisions that you can compare, and a three way merge is what Git, uh, for instance, is, is using. Uh, to perform its conflict solution. Right, so once we've got these replication services in, we can start looking at replication and, and put in a replication API. So there's no UI currently for this step. This is just a, an API, so the UI will still live in, uh, in Contrib like it does now. The way we have it currently working in Contrib is using tag services. So the workspace module has a replicator that replicates between local workspaces, and the relaxed module has a different replicator that goes over the, the CouchDB API and replicates to different sites. It can also replicate to workspaces on one site, but just over a sort of HTTP loop. This is then extendable to any contrib module, you can build your own replicator and replicate however you like, and using those replication uh, services, you know sort of what revisions have changed, and you can do the replication however you like, and just tag it as a tag service, and it will get looped around. <coughs> as long as it applies, it will run. And uh, uh, just to be clear, within the scope of this initiative, it's only going to be um, targeting replication for local workspaces. Again. The, the API, it's, we're using tagged services, so Contrib can swap it in. But for the initiative, we're targeting the 80% use case, which is going to be single site replication between local workspaces. So now we've got a way to replicate content between workspaces, and we can start looking at conflicts. Um, as I said, currently in, in Contrib, we just pick one of the conflicting revisions. Um, but we'd be looking at adding the full conflict management API into core. And there's still so many implementation details to work out on this, but I'd like to see it as a pluggable system. So you could just sort of pick revision A or revision B, or you could have a full three-way merge, a big sort of a four-pane screen to sort of choose your revision, your, your conflicting uh, changes. So uh, hopefully we can make this a, a very sort of extendable API. So now that we've got all these APIs in, we can do replication um, and we can set up new workspaces. We'd want to put uh, an experimental API in. So this UI. is a UI, <laughs> an experimental UI to um, create workspaces, to switch workspaces, to replicate. Up until this point, it's going to still live in Contrib. So all of this that we're talking about today is possible now in Contrib. It's always going to be possible. We're going to try and sort of allocate time throughout our, our plan to update all of the Contrib modules so they work with all the core changes. Uh, but at this point, we'll, we'll start adding an experimental UI in. And it, it's a key part of, of the plan here, and, and the reason uh, why we're able to lay, lay it out like this is that this uh, is a solution that's been developed over the past two, two and a half years and is being actively used in Contrib and working in Contrib. Uh, so it's a solution that's been maturing for, for quite some time already, uh, all of these phases, and which we can lay them out in fairly good detail. So this is the end of, end of phase seven. Uh, where we put this experimental UI in. And the next phase, phase eight, we'll be looking at um, updating this UI and making it a lot better. We've already started working with some of the, the UX team. Um, we've got um, a UX guy um, 
also on our initiative team, uh, Joseph, so we're going to be working very closely with him to make sure that the UX is, is really good and, and works really easily. Um, we've even been saying that with the, with the contrib stuff that it is starting to look um, a lot easier than it actually is because the UI is, is, is quite simple, but it's, it's still not sort of nowhere near where we want it to be from a, a UX point of view. So phase eight is going to be um, going to be full of UX work. Um, first of all, the, the conflict management UI. Um, as I mentioned, we want this to be pluggable, so that there can be different ways of, of resolving conflicts, different UIs, um, maybe different permissions, so different users view different UIs for for resolving conflicts. And then we want a, a better workspace UI. Um, we're looking at things, for example. Uh, a drop down or a slide in bar um, so you can easily switch between your workspaces and create workspaces and if you've got sort of hundreds of workspaces search them um, even moderation states on workspaces so you can see sort of a different color or a different um, state change on the workspace depending on the moderation state so there's a lot of um, ideas for that UI and uh, Sort of, we're welcoming a lot of other ideas. So, if you do have any suggestions, then please put them forward. Um, we'd be looking at a revision moderation module. So, as I mentioned earlier on, um, there's, we're looking at adding a moderation API into Core. Um, so, this moderation module would use that API and provide uh, the UI for all of this this moderation. And a lot of dis uh, discussions and conversations that we've already had throughout this DrupalCon is that we're probably going to put uh, the UI for the moderation early on in, in the phases. Because uh, this is, again, sort of the 80% use case. Just moderating a single entity um, is, is a very common use case. So we're looking perhaps to move this to earlier phases. Because it doesn't depend on. Yay! Because uh, it doesn't depend on everything that we've mentioned before, so it's possible to move this earlier. Um, phase 8 currently, that's, I think, Drupal 8.54? 4, I think. 4, which is still some, some time away, right? Can we get that earlier? I think that'll satisfy a lot of people. So if we do the move this, well, when we do move this earlier, um, this will just be the moderation of single entities, the moderation of workspaces. Obviously, it's going to have to wait till we have workspaces. Um, so this will probably still be later on. Um, and this will allow you to moderate sort of a collection of, of entities as one. We'd also be looking at adding a, a cross-site content staging. Um, this is not in our sort of main plan. We put this as sort of phase X. Um, a sort of nice to have phase. Um, this is currently working in Contrib, as we said. It will always live in Contrib, but if we do have time at the end, if we have a lot of sort of consensus that this might be something nice to get in, then we can look at this cross site content staging. Um, so, this is what we've been talking about using the CouchDB API. Um, there's also a lot of discussion about. Um, REST APIs in core and sort of how they're going to look and how they're going to evolve. Um, so this sort of might be conflicting with those. Um, it might work well with those. There's still lots of discussion discussion to go on this. Um, so it's, that's why it's in phase X. Another feature that's in our nice to have is autosave. <coughs> this is something that a lot of people have wanted for a long time. And there's been so many issues and so many patches open for this already, but it's such a complex problem to solve. One thing that we've sort of been thinking about is whether it could use the uh, the REST API and that things auto-save to your local storage on your machine, and then the content is replicated from your local machine up onto the, the site at the end. Um, but the, you know, there's so many ideas, so many discussions already. And the idea there with uh, auto-saving to your local storage is that if you would be working away on your site, on your laptop, and you would lose an internet connection, it would still keep auto-saving. 
And then once you get your internet connection back, we can replicate that from local storage back to the server uh, using the tools that we already touched on this uh, REST API and something called PouchDB. Still, a lot of the discussions and ideas happening here. Um, and it's sort of in the nice to have. So it's not a scheduled phase at the moment in the initiative. Uh, but we're happy to, you know, hear everyone's feedback on that. Great. So that comes to the end of all of our plan. And um, we'd sort of welcome any, any questions, any ideas, or any discussion. Um, yeah, go ahead. Uh, please step up to the mic. And, and if, if more of you have questions, uh, line up. Uh, this is a core conversation, so we'd love to have the conversation going. Just a quick question about how this, if at all, would, how you're considering the theming system in all this in terms of moving blocks around and new regions. Is that something at all that you've considered in terms of tracking those at the revision level? It's not in scope for this, um, this yet. Um, as, as Dries mentioned on, on Tuesday, there are sort of other initiatives that are being sort of talked about that, that might include something like that. And one thing to sort of stress with this is we're looking at content entities only. So block content is a content entity, but the block itself is a config entity. Um, so that's something that you'd um, export out to a YAML file and add into your Git workflow. Um, so there are a lot of sort of um, workflow changes on this because you've got to make sure that all of your config is config is on the live site before your content is. So um, yeah, there's going to be a lot of changes. And and just a further clarification there, uh, we're not looking um, at all at making it possible to have different content for diff uh, different config for different workspaces on a single site. Config will remain the same across all workspaces. It's only content that we sort of compartment, compa co uh, what's, compartmentalize. What's it? There you go. Thank you. Um, uh, so no config here. So you can't like place a block in a workspace that wouldn't exist in another uh, a block position. Yeah. I get. I have two questions. So one question: the big problem that I've run into with revisions in the past is the way it can bloat the database. And obviously, if we make everything revisions, I mean, we've had situations where people have a thousand revisions of a single node. Uh, have you thought about that? What you know? What would? What? What's the solution for that? So we've started thinking about purging revisions. Um, it's nothing we've implemented even in, in Contrib yet, uh, but maybe something like sort of every third revision gets uh, purged or um, after a certain time purge all revisions, maybe a UI that you can choose these kind of parameters. Um, but yeah, it's definitely something we need to think about because with both uh, revisions and the indexes that we've talked about, we're going to be adding a lot of new data. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we need to really think about that. Yeah. And uh, yeah. That's that's yeah. what we've done, yeah. you know, with with like update hooks in, in the past has yeah. been anything older than such and such yeah. a date, you know, that kind of thing. And I was discussing with Ken Rickard uh, yesterday, and he suggested that if this turns out to be like a performance problem, then well, because it is it is going to be important for conflict resolution and replication of let's say old or stale workspaces um, to have uh, revision data. So perhaps the solution could also be to in the entity API, introduce like a stash or an archive storage so that we move old stuff over to the secondary storage mm -hmm. where we still store it. But the, the, the main queries, the like day-to-day -day queries, if you may, on the entity API would run on a sort of lighter storage. Mm -hmm. um, and then you could like join on that archive storage yep. if you need the history. Yep. Uh, cause then, then you'd come around the performance problem. You wouldn't come around the storage problem. But today, storage is cheap, and that's not necessarily. It's, it's a still an issue for some. Yeah, it, it yeah. certainly yeah. is. It certainly it's is. Nothing, but it's it's yeah. could be sort of a solution. And then.
So, so my unrelated question is, have you talked about scheduling? Because that's the other editorial thing that comes up over and over is yep. scheduling things, right? Um, yes, uh, there has been uh, talk ab about scheduling. Uh, currently, it's not in scope for the initiative, but if people want it, let's build it. Um, we have uh, Ted. Um, Ted has been working with us in, in Contrib, and he has built modules around scheduling. Um, uh, so, so there is work ongoing in the community to sort of uh, have scheduling work with all of these bits and pieces because it's certainly something people are asking for. And, and if it's you know, something we think is a big use case, let's add it to the initiative. If, if there's consensus and agreement, you know, we're all here, here to plan together. So. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, put forward more feedback like that and you know, we'll, we'll certainly look at it for sure. Yeah, next question. Hey, thanks for the work and thanks for the presentation. Um, one of the challenges that we've had in the past with workflow, maybe a simple answer from you guys, and it may be just kind of, you know, the ecosystem will continue to evolve. But um, workflow has a lot of assumptions about how people actually work. And I wonder if you could speak just briefly to how much control over things like, um, you know, whether workflow assumes uh, people who aren't in the, named in the workflow are excluded from access, and you know, just kind of some of those you know, workflow assumptions that especially are in Workbench and, and um, Workflow. Yeah, so we've tried to make this as flexible as possible, and when working on the Contrib side, it's extremely flexible, but then we come to implement a UI for this, and if we make something so flexible in the UI, then it becomes so confusing and complicated to use. So we've tried to come up with sort of sensible defaults for the UI, but left the, the API as flexible as we possibly can. Um, so maybe we look at sort of adding different contrib modules that, that provide different UIs. Um, as you saw from earlier on in the, in the presentation, we've got quite a lot of contrib modules that make up this and a number of those are optional, just because there's different workflows and you need different modules for different things. When we've, sort of about a year ago, we probably had maybe two or three modules that made this up, and now we're up to like five or six. So that's just to, to add this flexibility. So um, yeah, it's definitely something that we are keeping in mind. A uh, nitpicky question: Can I um, opt out of revisions in your UID still for my content entities after these core changes? Um, I, I certainly think that that should be an option. The, I, I can see that there are use cases. What, what we then have to make clear to developers and end users of the API is that you won't be able to move this particular content to other workspaces. It, it'd be something that stays there. Okay, but um, the change that already went in with the inheriting those fields, or is there a way to opt out of that? Um, so we have we haven't started making any assumptions around around that yet. So uh, we certainly should should have something. I, and I think something it would be in the in the annotation of the entity type. It would say, you know, opt out from workspace, like from from replication or something, or or opt out from uh, revisions. Um, Seems yeah. a little problematic in terms of yeah backward compatibility since I just wrote a module that yeah. <laughs> doesn't want those. So inheriting the, the base fields at the moment, um, it, the content entity base class uses a lot of the entity keys. So if there's a UUID entity key set, then it gets the UUID field. If there's not, then it doesn't. Um, same with the revision and the bundle fields. Um, so yeah, it gets the fields if, if it's got the right annotation. Any more questions, or does everyone want to see a demo of deploy? Yeah, okay. So let's uh, have a look if we can do this. So here we're looking at um, a single site content staging. Close for a moment. 
And yeah, hey, you probably don't have to go in. Yeah. So you'll see up in the top toolbar, we've added a number of new things that you don't get in, in core. And just to kind of note first that this is all contrib stuff. So this is stuff that's available now. You can use this today on your sites. So up in the top toolbar, you've got uh, where it says stage on the top right there. This is then a drop down that gives you a switcher for workspaces. So you can see we've got a live and a stage workspace. And down the other side, you can add a new workspace. Then next, we've got the update button that allows you to update your current workspace. This is a bit like a, a git pull or a git rebase to pull down any changes. And you've got deploy, which is to push your changes. So let's get playing this, where we're going to add uh, an article. And so this is just kind of a standard node. Um, we're going to add a title. We're going to add a body. And then we're also going to add um, some other entity reference type data. So we're adding a menu link. So a menu link is actually a separate content entity, but it's just attached to this node using an entity reference. And we've added three tags there as well, which are also entity references to separate taxonomy term entities. So we can now switch over to live and back to stage and see that there was no content on live. There is content on stage. We could create a deployment. So we give each deployment a title. Um, so you can look back at a, a log of your deployments and now switching between live and stage. The content is there. The menu link is there. All the taxonomy terms are there. So they all stay connected um, and they all get transferred over as one. We're now making an edit on the live site. So we're editing the node title and also the menu link. So when we save that, you'll see that the menu link has changed and the, the title have changed again. They're two separate entities. And back on stage, they haven't changed, but you can do an update, and that will pull things down from live to stage. So that's how it currently works in, in Contrib, and this is kind of ideas that we're looking at when moving to core as well. Do you want to step up to the mic? Sure. Sure. Um, I think it's actually just a, a quick question. of I've messed with that a couple of months ago um, and was both excited but then I hit the file, the image field, and the file object didn't sync. Has that been addressed, or is that being addressed in relative short order? Um, I mean, everything was clearly still marked as under development at the time, so it yeah. wasn't shocking so there were pieces missing. We, we have been working quite a lot on, on file entities, or Andre's been working quite a lot on file entities, and, and that's working, I believe. Um, okay. I, I don't think we've had any issues for, for a while now. And, and we recently had patches also for media, so both file entities and media is, is, is working, because those are two different entities. Right. Um, I think we still need more test coverage here, but it's certainly high up in the priority order to, Great. to address that. Thank you. So I've got a second demo video here for uh, cross-site. So you'll see right up in the top bar there, I've got two tabs open, Drupal 1 and Drupal 2. Um, I've added a, a user called Replicator. So this is a user that we use to authenticate between the two different sites. And we've got a special role and special permissions for the Replicator user. So we're going to add that Replicator user in as our default Replicator user on Drupal 1. So if anyone needs access to Drupal 1, they'll, they'll use those credentials. We're going to add a remote. So this is where we add what Drupal 2 is. Um, we add in the URL and also the, what we call the API route, so it's just relaxed by default. And we add the replicator user. That user also exists over on Drupal 2. So then we can go over to the workspace UI and edit the live workspace. And we can set the upstream to the live workspace on Drupal 2, because when we added the remote, it knows about all the workspaces on Drupal 2 and adds them as, as upstreams. So we can then add an article exactly the same as in the other demo with menu links and, and taxonomy terms and push that over to Drupal 2. So this is using the, the CouchDB API for replication. Um, so this is the, the relaxed module. And it doesn't actually use uh, CouchDB. You don't need CouchDB installed, but it's exactly the same API. We've built a, a CouchDB replicator in PHP as a Google Summer of Code project last year. Um, so it's using that uh, PHP replicator. 
So exactly the same UI from deploy, um, give it a title, push it over. It takes a little bit longer because it's running over um, HTTP um, to a separate site. Um, but we can now go over to Drupal 2 and we'll see that the, the content's there. And just the same as the first demo, we can make changes on, on Drupal 2, which is our, our live site, and uh, push them back to, to Drupal 1. So you make it more of a pure, uh, yeah, so the question is, can you do a pull? And that's kind of what we've got with the update button. Um, and it pulls down from the upstream. Um, so that, that, yeah, that's currently how we've, we've implemented that. But as I said earlier, these APIs are very flexible. So if you want to build a, a different UI um, to sort of select where you want to pull from and, and what you want to pull to, then um, then it's sort of very flexible and, and the UIs can be very easily built for that. Because I, I saw you were adding a static AI uh, or fetching static from the initial site. You were, you were adding a remote. Right. Rather than having a remote say, I have credentials, so I'm going to pull this out of the, the canonical site, even though it was necessarily out of the uh, Right. So. So, so basically having uh, some sort of discovery mechanism so that you wouldn't explicitly have to state the relationship between two sites. Um, well, on, on the, the client side, so entering some API key and saying, all right, I now have access to the master. I'm going to start pulling mm -hmm. yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting one. Uh, let's discuss it more afterwards, perhaps, so to understand. Yeah. Everyone want to step up to the mic and can. What about uh, manual linkways when you have a system um, and you have a different menu structure on another web service? Is, is this a solution or how do you handle this? Okay, so the question is uh, about menu links and if there's a different menu structure. And um, yeah, it can be tricky. Um, the menu links are currently attached with entity references, I believe, and we we switch all of those to UUID so we can attach them up, but then if you've got a different URL, um, there are different sort of node IDs between workspaces um, because they are, in fact, two different uh, nodes. Um, so the best suggestion there is to use something like Path Auto and make sure that you've got the same, um, same settings so that it generates the same URL on, on, each, uh, on each workspace or each site. In, in general, uh, what we're looking at here conceptually is replication, right? So y it will be tricky if you, if you move content between two sites that are different. You certainly can. There's nothing that stops you. But we, we, lo we, we look at it as replication. So we want to like, replicate what's uh, in one place to the other place so that they are in the end the same. Um, if you're looking at content sharing between sites, then perhaps you would uh, choose to only replicate certain content entities and not something like menu links, right? That could that are most likely going to be different between the two sites. Uh, we have a concept coming of um, filtered replication, so you could do exactly that, like replicate only nodes or only terms or terms and nodes or so, and skip the menu links. If you, if you do have that sort of use case where you want to share and something might be different between the two sites. Um, so deploy module exists for D7. Um, it looks significant, significantly different and um, um, it's certainly not as powerful as this and will never be able to be. There are some key, uh, you know, things that are missing in the entity API for, for Drupal 7. Um, 
So conflict management and sort of this workspace concept will never be able to be implemented in Drupal 7. What you need in Drupal 7 is then two different sites. You need a dedicated stage site and a dedicated production site. And then you can use deploy uh, between the two. And just in the past uh, month or two, we've actually opened up a new uh, major version of the Drupal 7 module with a big number of improvements that Dave Hall has been working on. Um, so if you've been using or looking at deploy module for Drupal 7 before, it has recently got a big overhaul. So uh, with UI improvements and some stability improvements. So, so it's certainly not anywhere close to what we're looking at here, but it's a, it's a decent solution for sure for Drupal 7. Okay. I think that's it. Thanks. <laughs>